Church, we are in our series, Up Close and Personal with Christ, and we're walking through the Gospel of John together. And this morning we'll be in the first part of John chapter 2, a familiar story to many of us. This morning I'm going to read it as a whole cloth, and then we're going to keep it open and take a little bit of a slower tour through it. John chapter 2. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. And Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited. And they ran out of wine. And Jesus' mother said to him, we're out of wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And Jesus' mother looked at the servants and she said to them, do whatever he tells you to. Now, there were six stone jars nearby, the kind that the Jews used for a ritual purification and washing. And Jesus, they held each about 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, you need to go fill these jars with water. And the servants did so. And they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now, Draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine, and he didn't realize where it had come from, although the servants who had drawn the water knew. And he called the bridegroom aside and he said, Everyone else brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best until now. This was the first of the miraculous signs that Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for this. Thank you that this is in the Bible, Lord. Make it come alive for us on this day. In Jesus' name we pray. (coughs) Amen. I looked up, and the best man was crying. And it wasn't the kind of crying that's ugly face, horrible things are happening. It was the kind of crying that happens when your joy's too big and it comes out. I looked up, and the best man was crying. The best man was a party boy, kind of a bon vivant. He was always making jokes, and the bride was rather nervous to have him as a best man, frankly, because she was just so sure he wasn't going to remember the rings. (laughs) And part of my job when I officiated a wedding is I go hang out with the groom and his party in the room just before the wedding. This was not a church family, no one any of us know here. We were circled up in one of those rooms, And I'm the old lady with the robe on, and I say, all right, we're going to hold hands and we're going to pray. These guys made it very clear to me. They were not interested in praying, but I prevailed. And we held hands in a circle, and we prayed. And when I looked up, the best man was crying. And he hugged the groom, and they shared a moment. And there was joy. Isn't there something about a wedding? There's something beautiful about a community coming together to bless a couple as they declare their intent to be a family, to be seen as a unit. They stand in front of their people and they make impossible promises that none of us, even those of us who are married, ever really keep 100%. A marriage in scripture is a symbol of joy. And as Mickey said, the whole community would come together. I had the joy of being invited as a guest to a wedding this fall, and the bride was Jewish and the groom was Christian. And they did the Hava Nagala, dun dun da 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 dun dun, and I'd never been to one. Have you? It's amazing. The whole party, actually all of the Jewish people came around and circled around the bride and groom and they went clockwise and counterclockwise and the Gentiles were sitting there. We were a little bit intimidated and they pulled us in. 
they pulled us in and we were dancing and going around in circles and oh my goodness the joy that's a sign that points beyond itself isn't it that the community is encircling this couple and saying we think that you as a family are important and we have to celebrate you a marriage feast in scripture is a symbol that points beyond itself it points to joy it's a metaphor the promised redemption in scripture is a wedding feast God as the groom God's people as the bride Song of Solomon is all about it you see it in the book of Ruth you see it when it goes bad in the book of Hosea Isaiah to Revelation there's this great wedding feast of the Lamb marriage is one of the best metaphors for our relationship to God because God loves us and God keeps God's promises to us well these two things haven't changed over the thousands of years since Jesus walked marriage is a part of the roots of our communities when a person makes a commitment to another and a marriage is a sign it points beyond itself we just read that this miracle was the first sign of Jesus I wonder why he chose his first sign to happen at a party weddings in Jesus day took one week the whole village came out and the groom was expected to provide for God for those people that came out it wasn't just something you joke about later if you ran out of wine like the way that my grandfather joked about running out of beer at my parents wedding <laughs> really every anniversary can you believe all your friends drink all that beer no <laughs> Well, yes, we can believe that, but um, <laughs> I digress. <laughs> it was shameful. My grandfather would have been out in town at the grocery store and seen somebody and had to hide because it was so embarrassing that he'd run out of something that was desired at that party. That's a shame to run out of the provisions. So a sign points to something beyond itself. Today we're going to look what happened walk through the passage sort of verse by verse and ask what does this passage tell us about God and what does this passage tell us about us so where are we we're in chapter 2 chapter 1 the word became flesh and dwelt among us Jesus now has five disciples and a couple of them had been taken not taken had gone from uh, John the Baptist over to Jesus remember John the Baptist was an ascetic he lived an isolated life in the desert eating locusts and wearing uncomfortable clothes <laughs> on the third day a wedding took place in Cana at Galilee Jesus mother was there and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding okay Jesus mother was at a wedding in an area close to where Jesus grew up just a little side note Jesus mother in the Gospel of John is never named interesting can you imagine what it would be like to be Jesus I hope not right <laughs> but he he's the word incarnate recognized as the Messiah he has a really big job to do right the people are in trouble his job is to solve a problem what's the problem <laughs> we're the problem <laughs> Eugene Peterson when he's talking about one of the Psalms talks about how God doesn't see us as problems to be solved God sees us as people to be loved how often do we see people around us as problems to be solved and forget that they're people to be loved so Jesus has a lot of problems to solve he and his new disciples have a lot of hard work to do and you would think they'd like go off on retreat and memorize scripture together or something for their first activity but instead they go to a wedding they go to a big party in the community together why seems interesting doesn't it the first place they go as a group is to a wedding to a party maybe they went because they're invited maybe they went because Jesus prioritized loving the people around them him I wonder what the disciples that used to follow John the Baptist were thinking awesome we don't have to eat locusts today <laughs> right John man he has us out in the desert and we're pointing at people and telling them to repent but this guy we get to go to a party with him Wow what a contrast 
Verse 3. They're at the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you to. All right, we've already talked about how running out of wine at a wedding in this day and age is much more embarrassing than it would be today. Remember, there's no Diet Coke, there's no Snapple, there's no mimosa. It's wine, it's water, and it's goat's milk. That's it. People drink wine. It was kind of a requirement. But wait a minute. Weren't Mary and Jesus and his five disciples so far, weren't they guests at this wedding? How would they know that there was wine running out? You know, have you ever been to a wedding where you're one of the inside circle and maybe you helped to make a centerpiece? Or maybe you helped with the flowers? Or maybe you helped to hem a dress? I think that's what Mary is to these people that are getting married. I think she's kind of in the butler's pantry here. I think that because the servants are within earshot. And I think that because she knows that they're about to run out of wine, which would have been something to hide. And I think that because she's upset. At least I infer that she's upset. So they're kind of in the butler's pantry, Jesus and his disciples and Mary, and she's concerned. And he says to her, woman, (laughs) a lot has been made out of this little verse. It's the passive-aggressive mother making her son do something. (laughs) I don't think that's there. I don't. I'm certainly not a passive-aggressive mother myself. (laughs) Him saying to her, woman, is kind of the equivalent of us saying ma'am. I've heard some of you southern families have your children call you ma'am. It's like she says, my loose translation is, son, we have a problem. And he says back to her, ma'am, who's we? Right? It's not totally respectful, but it's not completely disrespectful. Right? My hour has not yet come. So there's a problem. They're insiders with this family. They're in the butler's pantry. And the mother's last words to the servants are, you do whatever he tells you to. Verse 6. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they fill them to the brim. All right, so when we're thinking about these six stone water jars, think about those big blue tubs that some people put under their gutters to catch rainwater, sort of a cistern. Those tend to hold about 50 gallons, so a little bit smaller than that. And they're made out of stone, they're heavy. And most households in this day and age only had two of of them at the house. So what? There's six? Either this is a very wealthy family with a very big house, or more likely, people in town brought their stone, stone, stone jars over for this washing because it's kind of important. It's used for ritual purification in a ceremonial religious way. You had to be clean enough, metaphorically and literally, in order to participate in community. You had to be clean enough. There were a lot of rules. A devout wedding ceremony here would have required a lot of washing. Six stone water jars, 20 to 30 gallons each. That's about 150 gallons. That's about 756 wine bottles worth of liquid. That's 63 cases of wine. That would last a while. Verse 8. Then he told them, draw some of that water out. He didn't say water. He said, now draw some of it out and take it to the master of the banquet. Jesus is up close and personal with the servants. Who's the most invisible person at a wedding? The caterer. The people walking around with those trays. You only notice them if your favorite food is gone, (laughs) right? The people walking around with trays and cleaning up after you are the people that we are least likely to notice. Who did Jesus notice? Servants. 
Now let's just put ourselves in the sandals of these servants. Some woman has a conversation with her son back where you're working, and then she leaves the room and she tells you, okay, just do whatever he says. And you do. And you fill up the water jars, and you have no idea what this guy, who this guy is, what he's up to. And you fill them up to the brim, and now he says, okay, I want you to scoop it out and take it to your boss. What? This was probably not drinking water. <laughs> I want, we, there's so many things to ask in this passage. We don't know how he turned the water to wine. Did he stand over the stone and say a prayer, and all of a sudden it turned into wine? Was it still water when the servants scooped it up to take it to their boss? Can you imagine being a servant? I would maybe not want to do that. So Christians, aren't we that servant? Jesus sometimes says to us, right, you do this. And we say, what? And then we do it, and it turns out to be beyond our wildest expectations. So they did it. There must have been something about Jesus that they just couldn't refuse him. Verse 9. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine, and he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. They got the first row seat. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you... Save the best till now. Let's just pause for a minute here and talk about wine. Scripture has two opinions on wine. It's so very, very, very clear that wine is not to be your master. Addiction is not okay. Drinking too much wine is not desirable, right? But Scripture also sees wine as a gift from God to make the heart glad and when you see wine in Scripture used in moderation and at a feast for a celebration, it symbolizes joy. Amos, Isaiah, Jeremiah, wine in abundance are promised in the time of salvation with the feast. Joel 3.18 says this, In that day, mountains will drip new wine, and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house. Amos 9. The days are coming, declare the Lord. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from the hills. So much wine. How many bottles did we say? 780-something. Revelation 19, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory because the marriage of the Lamb has come. So what about these stone jars that have been set aside for the purpose of of washing, a holy purpose. I wonder, will they ever be able to be used again for that purpose? Or have they been wrecked by the wine? Jesus sort of messed, messed this up. He replaced the water of purification with this abundant wine. Wow. Verse 11, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. A sign points beyond itself. What does this have to do with us? Debbie Blue is one of my favorite preachers. She's out of Minnesota and she tends to mess me up when I read her. And here's how she approached this passage. She says this, We have all sorts of rituals that are important to us to our religious practice or to how we think we should properly conduct ourselves in the world. Stop at stop signs, cough into your elbow, wash your hands. Jesus takes an important vehicle for the law, a stone jar, and fills it with wine, gallons of it. People often say this story is not about Jesus offending anyone, it's about joy, generosity, abundance. Even so, maybe these things are occasionally offensive. Excess. Excessive joy, excessive generosity, excessive abundance, excessive anything can sometimes offend. Something bursts out of the bounds of the expected. Something delicious, ex excessive, life and love. Good wine gushing out of the sink. But what if you just wanted to wash your hands? Moderation is more polite. Excess is an offense, garish. 
Jesus continues to come off in this wild way through John's gospel. He continues to be a little out there, a little too something, a little too much for the dominant ideology of his time. And then Debbie Blue says, I hope God keeps filling our sanitizing containers with good wine. (laughs) I hope God keeps causing us to look up and see ourselves not as problems to be solved, but as people to be loved. And this was the first of his signs. And the disciples saw it, and the servants saw it, and they believed. I looked up, and the best man was crying. May that also be our joy as we consider who Christ is in us. Alleluia. Amen.